Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it'll turn a lot of heads? Well, join us Saturday, February 24th at Jake's Bait and Tackle for the second annual kayak show and seminar. Starting at 11 a.m. will be the kayak show. The four categories this year are the DIY division, a kayak that costs less than a thousand bucks, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak, and the best in show. You will have a ton of kayaks there to be able to show off. If you want to ever get into kayak fishing, this is the time to go look at so many cool rigs and setups. We will also have a ton of seminars with a bunch of great guests. The first one, starting at noon, will be Mike Ortega of Northern Virginia Kayak Association. At 1 p.m., we'll have Selah Johnson. At 2 p.m., we'll have Jake Harshman. At 3 p.m., we'll have Matt Campbell. And rounding it up at 4 p.m., we'll have Joshua Evans. The overall seminar will be going from 11 a.m. to about 4 to 5 p.m. will be the whole event. If you would like to sign up your kayak, you can me email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you'd like to sign up your kayak to have a chance to win a ton of cool prizes, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. And we will see you Saturday, February 24th at 11 a.m. 15. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 15 Patreon subscribers away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, our newest sponsor who won best in show at the Richmond Expo. You'll also be a part of our private Facebook group community, weekly prize giveaways, and so much more. If you would like to support our show, check out our Patreon link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are here. We had an absolutely fantastic weekend that just finished off this insane run. We went six full weeks that we were either at a fishing show, at some kind of fishing function, or doing some type of fishing thing. We created over 50 hours of content, and I think we had over like 5,000 hours of watch time. We just drove back last night from the Augusta County Fishing Show and Expo. Absolutely a great time. Doug, you run a fantastic event, and I really appreciate you having me, Carly, and Jared of Jake's Bait and Tackle out. As you guys know, with all these things, ask you a question, you're going to win a prize from either Jake's Bait and Tackle or from Tiger Crankbaits. That's how this thing works. This is an absolute extravaganza. We have, this is probably the most people have had on a live stream besides that one time uh, we, we drank a lot with SB Fishing and Hunter. Uh, that was a rowdy one, but that's in the past. So without further ado, the first guest I'm going to interview, some say one of the martial art techniques he teaches is called the way of the smallmouth. He is one on many kayaks. His, he has been on the show twice, I think, no, three times. And he's actually, he actually finished in the top three in an NVKVA event. Uh, we got Chun, how are you doing tonight, sir? As he has disappeared from the camera. That is a perfect way. As you can tell, his technique is extremely good. So while he is doing all that stuff, cause you are on the show right now, sir. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, Hello, Hi. everybody. <laughs> yeah. So you know this guy. Um, we are talking about the Upper Potomac River Smallmouth Fishing and the uh, Potomac River Smallmouth Club. So the next individual we have on the show, the man, the myth, the legend, John, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Oh, th thank you for having me. Now, I'm going to interview. I'm just going to pull up all of our guests right now. Now, number the number three in this lineup is Steve Kim. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And let's see, we got one more back there. Last but certainly not least, number four is always the big power hitter. We got Jamie Gold. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Guys, I mean, we're doing great right now. We have 45 people watching on Facebook and YouTube, and we have 20 on Instagram right now. That is insane for this. I know this is a big small with extravaganza. So again, as always, keep the questions flowing in the comment section. We'll try to sprinkle them in here. Uh, really, I think first and foremost, I want to go round table here of how everyone kind of got into smallmouth fishing and got into this club. So um, I guess we'll start from my, because I'm dyslexic, I guess my right, uh, Chun, like, yeah, how did you get involved in this whole group? Um, I think uh, my first meeting was when I was in college. Um, the meetings were held at the National Wildlife Federation, which uh, I think the McLean Bible Church now sits on that property. 
Oh, wow. So this is late, late eighties, I think. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember the Washington post had the weekend section. I'm not, well, you might be too young for that, but, um, <laughs> The club used to advertise, I think, in the weekend section, and I just found it by random. And uh, the meeting at the Wildlife Federation, I swear, the first meeting I went to, there were probably 150 uh, members that were in the meeting. That's insane. Um, yeah. And uh, so I was in and out of the club since the, the late 80s. Um, so that's how I started with the club. But uh I started smallmouth fishing in high school with, with buddies that we used to go to, uh, what is that? Uh, below the American Legion bridge is a park on the parkway that we used to wade uh, for smallmouth right above little falls, actually. Wow. Yeah. How, how much of them or we'll actually get, we'll get through introductions first, I guess. And then, then we can kind of open it up to whoever wants to say something, says something. Um, John, I, I guess you're the next one up on this, this weird clock that we're doing here. You know, how did you get involved with the, uh, Potomac river smallmouth club? Um, I, I came across the club actually after it had moved to the Vienna Firehouse, but uh, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna actually pass it over to Steve Kim. He's our current president, and he's got a uh, he's probably got a pretty good uh, idea of our of our history and and also uh, you know just a little bit more about the club. So Steve, if you want to take it away, buddy. Uh, I think the question you were asking is about getting involved in fishing. Um, I got a, out of college in '90, grew up in Northern Virginia. Came back to the area sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was probably at a fishing show and they had a booth there. And, um, you know, it kind of was interesting to me. And that's kind of where I started with the club. And that's kind of the time frame, very late 90s, early, early 2000s. Is that what really got you hooked into fishing was this club? I, I fished as a kid growing up, but never really um, actively, um, you know, was pursuing smallmouth specifically. Uh, you know, today I, I mix a lot of freshwater, you know, smallmouth, largemouth, a lot of different species up uh, and certainly saltwater fish as often as I can. Um, so that's kind of the, the backdrop for me as far as fishing and growing up. Jamie, you're up next. Like what really got you into fishing and, and how did you find the club? Sure. <clears throat> so I learned to fish as a kid from my dad. I grew up in Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Philadelphia. Um, and fished up until about junior high or so, and then got busy doing other things. And then I was at uh, I was at Penn State in graduate school, oh, cool. and need, and needed something to do, so got back into fishing. And of course, there's all kinds of great fishing up in that area. Um, and then moved down to the D.C. area in 2001 for work. Um, and so I was looking around for fishing opportunities in the area. And in an online search, I came across the Potomac River Smallmouth Club. And so I joined in 2001. Um, and what I would say is, you know, as a kid in PA, I was more of a largemouth and trout fisherman. And by joining the club, it really uh, got me addicted to smallmouth fishing. I really fell in love with smallmouth fishing after joining the club and learning from the other club members. Was that your first time really tangling with smallmouth when you came down here? Because when I think Pennsylvania, I basically think trout, unless you're talking Susquehanna. Like, I feel like trout is the big deal up in Pennsylvania. Yeah, like I said, it was mostly trout, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then also largemouth, because I grew up near a lake that had largemouth in it. I ran into smallmouth a few times up in Maine. I used to spend a month every summer as a kid in Maine. Oh. And um, there's some really good smallmouth fishing up in Maine. Um, but then to do them on a consistent basis was down here on the uh, upper Potomac and then the Shenandoah rivers. I actually grew up on Hillcrest drive in Vienna, not far from, uh, from waters field down there near the fire station. And I think it's interesting when I think about where Vienna is and what it is now and how much it's blown up that you had a small mouth club meeting there. Uh, yeah, it's changed a lot. <laughs> it, it, dude, it, it has changed so much. I went down there two years ago for the first time, about six, seven years, because I moved when I was 12. So I think that was like 2002 when we moved out of there into the, like farm country of Western Loudoun. Um, and, and it's insane because I went to one club meeting and I was young. It was just one at the time. But to think in this metropolitan area, you could chase bronze backs. How... How does the club, and, and, and maybe I'll put this to you, Jamie, like how did the club form and, and how does it work? Do you all like fish kayak tournaments? You fish boat tournaments? Like how does the club work? 
Sure. Um, and uh, other guys, feel free to jump in. The club started back in 1988, and it really started, my understanding is sort of a group of friends got together who all shared a passion for small society, and they ultimately ended up forming the club really as a social gathering, as an environmental group as well. So the two <laughs> sort of um, commitments of the club from the very beginning are fishing and spreading knowledge of smallmouth fishing, and then also environmental efforts and supporting environmental efforts related to smallmouth fishing. Um, so it's always been sort of a very cool social club, sharing information, sharing insights, leading club trips, that sort of thing. We've never gotten really into the tournament fishing aspect. We're not a tournament club. I have no objection to those sorts mm -hmm. of clubs. I think that's great for those who do it. Um, that's just never been a part of the makeup of our club. It's more a social and environmental club. And just for everyone that, that's watching right now, just to make sure, like, how long has the club been around for? I, I probably just missed it. Since missed 1988. It anyway. Damn. That's crazy. The year I was born. That's freaking insane. It's been going on for this long. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm getting really old. Um, or you guys are just very old. We're, but we're, I don't know. Each. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot more correct. I'm just saying, half of us are dust. <laughs> 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 So, like how many times do you guys meet per year um is it because you're not doing tournaments generally speaking so is it you try to meet like once a month quarterly how does that work so kind of the schedule we're on now we meet the last wednesday of every month with the exception of december uh we're currently meeting just at the vienna inn in vienna oh, people God. usually get there six six thirty um you know have whatever you want to have to eat whatever you want to drink and talk fishing. Uh, that's kind of a scaled down version of where we've been in the past. As Chung had mentioned, 88, to my best knowledge, was the start of the club. It was started out the wildlife um, uh, refugee, which again, no longer exists. If you're familiar with kind of McLean Great Falls, that's where McLean Bible Church now sits. And I don't know how many acres it encompasses, but it's a lot of square footage as yes. far as the acreage that they took out. You um, are, oh, you are making me just, this is some nostalgia stuff right here for me. That's absolutely <laughs> insane. Thinking back to the Vienna Inn and going down there after baseball games. Oh my God. Um, so anyway, while I'm reminiscing on that, uh, one, one of the topics I really wanted to get into tonight, uh, you know, about the club and really about all, you guys have fished this area for so long is, is the upper Potomac in smallmouth fishing in general, it's gone through its ups and downs. And, and I really want to add to that where has the smallmouth fishing been and, and what do you think of it now? And honestly, I mean, whoever wants to go first, it's kind of open mic night. So just feel free to, to speak. Crickets. Don't be bashful. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so guys, uh, I'll, I'll look at this one first. I mean, when, when I first got uh, heavily involved in the club was late nineties, early 2000. And one of the reasons that it was so appealing to me is that it wasn't a group of tournament anglers and, there were people there, uh, you know, I mean, Al Pugh, Jack Cook, and these these guys, I mean, they'd been fishing, the, they'd been fishing the Potomac, you know, for 40 or 50 years when I met them. And it, what was so nice about that is you could sit down at a table with them and instead of them just saying, yeah, the fishing's great, good luck, son, they, <laughs> they would say, they, they'd actually say, yeah, it's fishing great, but by the way, you want to fish back eddies, and what you want to throw is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is you want to you you want to throw a spinner bait and slow roll it on the bottom because that's where that's where all the action seems to be in March, you know, in March because they're now starting to forage. Or last week I was out, and uh, you know, the the number one the number one bait for me happened to be, uh, you know, happened to be a tube, which that's almost that's almost any given week, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but uh, you know, and the, and the, but they were they were very you know, people in the club were very open about not only about what they were fishing, but it was a club led club led trips were probably the thing that got me really hooked on going to the club. Um, every single, I mean, all, all three, all three of these other guys that are on here. Um, uh, well, that's not true. I knew Chun, I knew Chun from high school, but that's, 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 a, really? whole, that's a whole, that's a whole different story. Oh, but, no, uh, I need to, I need uh, to know a little bit of that whole, how, did you whoa, guys whoa. fish together in high school? Uh, no, no, not, I mean, at that, at, at, at that time, uh, you know, Chun, Chun was a big wig celebrity, uh, <laughs> you know, so we, we won't, you know, he can, he can tell you that story. Uh, I, I, I won't bother with it, pun intended. <laughs> and, 
the, but the, as far as Steve and Jamie are two of my closest friends and we, we have formed our friendship through the club. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, I had never really met either of them before that. So really the fact that it was an environmentally based club, people mm -hmm. had similar interests in, you know, in, in pursuing fishing, but sharing it with others so that the sport would grow and going at it from a conservation standpoint is what really got uh, us engaged. I know that has nothing to do with the question about us for where the state of the rivers are. Uh, you know, we, in, in 2003, we had a really bad fish kill. Yep. Uh, things have come back a lot. It's sort of yo-yoed in about the last five years. And uh, I think last year was one of the, one of the better fishing years that I had both on the upper Potomac and on, uh, and on its branches on the Shenandoah and uh, you know, in, in a few of the creeks off of there. Oh, we could talk for an hour on the Shenandoah. That, that's yeah. freaking sure about how that place has come back. Uh, uh, that, that, the, I love the, that river. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, I absolutely, I, I adore that place. And yeah, I, I think the Upper Potomac right now, I think it's safe to say it, it's fishing better than it has in a long time. If you look at the weigh-ins of either, you know, jet boat tournaments or kayak tournaments, um, and that's actually something, you know, I, I should have actually been intelligent enough to ask everyone, is, is everyone fishing from a kayak, a jet boat, beating the bank? Like, what does everyone so have? The club is kind of a mixed bag. Majority of the people in the club fish from kayaks. We do have a small contingency that are canoe people. We do have a small smattering of jet boat people. And there's a probably the smallest number is inflatables. So cataracts. Um, right. yeah. Cataracts, really? Wow. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know people were still using those. That's really neat. Yeah. I We're old. Steven, I love that thing. John, John and I actually kind of own the same boat, same frame. We have different pontoons. I have a two-person, 14-foot pontoons. Um, I float, you know, both with oars and with the trolling motor. Any floats you go on, there's going to be, you know, dead water you want to move through. It's nice to be able to drop the trolling motor and kind of zip you through that and get back to where, you know, you think the smallmouth are going to be. Mm. I mean, I mean, Jamie, let me ask you, because I've asked Chun this about seven times since he's been on this. She's basically just a, a, an old veteran of the show. How how have you seen the river change in, in, in the years? Yeah, what I would say is when I first joined the club in 2001, the fishing was really, really good. Um, then, as John mentioned, we had the fish kills. Then there was a, a comeback. But then I would say probably about the last five or six years, it was it got really tough and it was my understanding from talking to like, um, you know, the wildlife fisheries management and those folks, we had about seven or eight years of really bad spawns. Yeah. And then we had that really high water, I think 2019. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that really scoured out the bottom of the river. So all the grasses where we knew where the grasses were, whether Algonquian park or up towards Seneca breaks, all literally got scoured out. Now, the last year, year and a half, the grasses have been coming back. Mm -hmm. And for me and for the people I talked to, the fishing has been getting much better. Um, and so the fishing last year, for me anyway, was better than it has been in quite a while. Um, getting more fish and getting bigger fish. Um, and so I'm really encouraged that, uh, you know, barring any other issues, we'll, we'll continue to have um, improving fishing as we go forward. Now, the other thing that's cha really changed is um, the number of kayaks I see on the river. Yes. Um, that has really exploded in popularity on the Potomac, upper Potomac for smallmouth fishing, mm. um, uh, which is great. You know, it's great to see a lot of people out there utilizing the resource and fishing and that sort of thing. But that's been one of the big changes from an angler perspective that I've seen. I, I think you have like pre-COVID kayaking and post-COVID kayaking. I really think you can go there with, especially since, you know, I remember when Hobie first came in and like, oh, you, you can pedal now. This is a big deal. To now, everyone's got a Torquedo. There's so many accessories, so many different brands that are so accessible, I guess, like convenient. Um, I mean, they're Cadillacs right now. A lot of these kayaks you can get now. And I 100% agree with you. There's been an explosion in kayak. As a member of a, of a, of a kayak tournament organization myself, um, you know, and, and with that said, I know, guy. oh my God, you guys have so many questions just streaming in here. And we'll make sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to all of your questions before before we go here. Um, wintertime fishing is, is something, we're right here, we're in this weird kind of, it, for Virginia, this is still winter, this this February lull, and we should get to be getting a snowstorm here in the next week, and then it'll be raining and it'll be springtime. But with that said, we are in late winter going into that, that spring transition. How many of you ha have been out on the water or will be out in the water soon? 
I'll be out soon. Uh, I, I was actually planning on going. Uh, I was planning on going last week, and a uh, couple of couple of life things happened that got in the way. But, mm. but uh, I, I I try to fish year round. I try to fish most months. Uh, it, it, right now, right now, it's just uh, you know this is as Steve mentioned. Right now, it's really pick your holes. You you go. You're looking for winter holes. You're fishing slow and deep. Ooh. Anyone else got some thoughts on that? So so totally agree with what John said. Fishing slow and deep, tubes drag slow on the bottom, that sort of thing. Personally, I don't really fish the Potomac. Or anywhere locally, well, the Potomac much this time of year, because I'm in a canoe. And so one of my top priorities and one of the top priorities of the club is safety. And so you really have to be careful this time of year. You do not want to fall into the water. Um, or if you're out there, wear some sort of wetsuit or dry suit along, obviously, with a PFD. But even so, um, so typically I'm doing other types of fishing this time of year, um, whether that's just going to Maryland or Virginia for some trout fishing or heading out of state. Um, so I'm not uh, not much of a winter smallmouth fisherman. Fly rod when you're going out of state? Yes, fly rod, absolutely. I just got back from a trip to Florida and so was chasing uh, peacock bass and largemouth bass and then also um, snook tarpon and redfish. Um, so yeah. Fancy, dude, dang. All right, I'd rather be with you. Um, <laughs> let me know the next time you go. We got, uh, let's see here, here's a good. Craig Anthony, uh, we, uh, let's see, we fish a lot of Ned rigs. When fishing the upper Potomac, would you rig them or slowly drag them or fish like a swim bait? Uh, Craig, you just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Email me. Uh, you can also drop me a link on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, so who would like to answer that question or who has a thought on that? I'm happy to tackle it. What I would say is try one of all three suggestions. Let the fish dictate to you what they're biting with. We got Jason. Sense? What does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, just completely like just rotate through all of them there. Um, yeah. we got, so, sorry to, to add on to that real quickly. If you're fishing yeah, your Ned rig, you can either fish, fit, rig it, rig it traditionally and, and slow drag it on the bottom. Cause it's cold right now. You just, you're going to, you want to hop it just a couple inches at a time. The other thing that you can do with that is, uh, you can actually, uh, use like a mosquito hook in the nose of it and Texas rig it, and, hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and you can fish it that way. And that way you can actually just sort of let the bait move on its own a little bit. Those are the two methods that I like to use for Ned rig in the winter. John, what's your favorite color? <laughs> is, is a, who, who said that? That's, that's, that's such a running joke. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I was going to say there, there, there was a, there was a uh, Potomac River smallmouth uh, meeting where we got in a big heated discussion about color. Uh, and there was, a, there was a guest speaker we had. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was saying color doesn't matter. Um, I fished. Uh, I fish often with groups of people, and they will all be throwing the same exa exact bait, except for color. So color will matter. And but that being said, it doesn't matter as long as you throw white, black, or a, or a uh, green pumpkin. So there. <laughs> white, white, uh, yeah, black. I like. I like black. I think it's interesting when um when you read a Bassmaster magazine, they just tell you the cleaner the water, the clearer the water it has to be a natural color. When it's a dark, opaque color. You're, you're going to want to actually go with a darker color bait. But then with smallmouth, I've had clear water thrown a June bug or something dark and I've kicked butt what? on it. So it's like, what the hell is going on there? And I, I do think it's like because what they're probably eating is dark as well. And they really want that match the hatch, depending on, again, you know, what what's hatching. If there's, you know, mad tom bite, something like that as well. Um, let's see. Oh, my God. You guys are just flooding the questions. As always, guys, drop a question. If I like it, uh, we will get a little comment there. Um, oh, this is a great question right here from Jason T. The Potomac borders multiple states. What license would I need to fish? I think Virginia and Maryland uh, allow reciprocal. They do. In the upper Potomac. So if you're fishing for smallmouth, anything above uh, Great Falls is considered upper Potomac and Virginia. And uh, yeah, Virginia and Maryland share. And then I would say, like, if you go all the way up into my area near uh, Hancock, Pawpaw, then I think it's West Virginia and Maryland, West Virginia, too. Right. Yeah. And then that gets to, where was that that hot button question from Brandon? Uh, what would you consider the upper Potomac? And will the flathead kill off the smallmouth like they do on the Susquehanna? I saw my first flathead where I fish in the upper Potomac. and Grumble. 
Yeah, I, I hope it yeah, doesn't. Well. This fish was massive. It was, um, yeah. I hope it doesn't. But they're up there. Yeah, I would consider it from anything above anything that's non-tidal is what I consider the upper Potomac. That's how I basically uh, delineate it. You know, above the break line, I have caught a couple of flathead up near Williamsport, but that is also ground zero. That is apparently where the D the DNR said like the catfish tournaments released them allegedly was in that area. So yeah, there it's massive. It's really hard to catch googly eye uh, sunfish. Just don't exist anymore. There's still a good smallmouth population, but. I, Time will tell. The Susquehanna, and Brandon, that's a different, hard question because the Susquehanna is freaking massive. It is a big right. ass river compared to the Upper Potomac. So, could it be worse than there? Possibly. Could it be not as bad? I just, I, I don't know. That's why they pay the biologists the big bucks, though. Let's see here. We got another one yeah, here. Yeah, I would ask where on the Susquehanna because I fished the Susquehanna up above Harrisburg several times last year. And had some of the most incredible smallmouth fishing I've ever had anywhere. Um, so maybe I don't know if it's lower down. Maybe they're devastating yeah. them. But Listen, not uh, everyone is as good of a fisherman as you, Jamie. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Real I'm not that good, John. You know that. <laughs> Especially well, when I'm with a fly rod, just you know, soaking feathers. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't see what people are complaining about. This is easy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what happened? Oh, there is. Uh, we got bucktail fishing. Uh, I work along the Potomac near Williamsport. Hey, boss, you're near me. How how bad the river got scored a few years ago was crazy. Grass was all but gone for a while. And yep. and this one I'll take because I talked to God knows how many biologists right now. It but rivers are so sub like they are so affected by the different rains and the different seasons compared to a lake or a tidal body of water. And when you have a big blowout during the spawn it just kills that whole class and you saw that in doe you saw that in the potomac potomac was fortunate enough where it didn't have like the mercury dump that happened on the shenandoah so it, it didn't have the double whammy but it'll it'll completely just blow out a river and you're done and luckily knock on wood you're starting to see the grass come back and the bluegill i think are going to start coming back the sunfish in some areas as well yeah i think that uh i think that storm year we had three uh three or pardon me two 100 year flood events and one 200 year flood event all in one year yeah so uh so it did take a little while for it to recover but you know i think as all of us have experienced uh you know last last year year and a half it's it, it's been fishing pretty darn well and the grasses have come back quite a bit yeah. um mm -hmm. especially like i fish around algonquin park up seneca breaks um even uh, some other places um the yeah. grass has come back a lot maybe not all the way but certainly much better than it was yeah i'm looking at over here on the old instagram and then stream yards if you could sync instagram with everything it'd be nice so i have to look down we got i think uh mbs uh chun what is your favorite bait and i'll add to that what is your favorite bait and this is from uh msb77 and why is it the swim jig <laughs> <laughs> That part I added. That's gotta be someone <laughs> That's I know. Funny. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like targeting the bigger fish, and so the swim jig uh, paired with a Kitek swim bait or a jackhammer. Yeah. I've been using jackhammers a lot as well. Um, the yeah, um, that, it's it's a big, it's a big smallmouth bait, and if you don't want to mess with you know the twelve inch and the smaller smallmouth, uh, you got to fish the bigger bigger baits are you fishing that well, right now too i'm sorry are you fishing the swim jig now and the chatterbait now no i'll start doing that in the in the spring post spawn like late march early april um like if i like march is my the time i really like to start um the, you know the the post spawn fish um march, march is pre spawn buddy a uh, pre spawn i'm sorry pre spawn <laughs> um I, I like using the hula grub uh mm -hmm. fishing slowly um, I'm not a big tube guy. I, I just, it's, I found it a pain in the butt to like, having to retie a hook every time I, my, my tube got messed up. So I stuck with the hula grub. I just, I, that, that seems to work just as good. Um, but fishing slow, but yeah, swim jig from spring through, through the fall, you know, I, I have two or three rods with different colored swim jigs on. Oh, let's do a, let's do a clockwise circle there. So you hate the tube. Fine. Would you be even more of a Ned rig then? And then, you know, let's go, let's go to Steve Ned rig or tube. If you had to pick. 
Both. <laughs> That's usually, when, I, when, I, when I roll out, I have five rods rigged and ready to go. Uh, I think the first question you asked, uh, starting with Chung, was like favorite bait. Yeah. My all-time favorite bait to throw is a double-bladed buzz bait. Now, again, hmm. that time of year, it can't be thrown in the wintertime. There's a point in spring where I'll start throwing it. I like it because it's compact. I like the double blades because of the noise. Again, uh, Chung said, bigger baits, bigger fish. So, like I said, when I'm out in the spring, I, I'm going to have a double-bladed buzz bait on, and I'm going to throw it until the fish say, hey, we're not biting. Mm. And then you're going to pick both a tube and a Ned rig to take the political right. answer. Again, it, it, oh. I probably no, no. I mean, if you I, know Steve, I have the luxury that most he has five are, rods and he throws each one three times and then changes every single one. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, because I, I floated in Floating a tackle box. I literally have more tackle on the river than any human should have. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just the facts. I mean, I have. Tackle to the right, tackle to the left, tackle in front, tackle behind. So uh, again, I'll I'll have both of those tied on. And and as Chung mentioned, I am an absolute fan of the skirted double tail uh, Yamamoto grub. Mm. We'll we'll put a pin in the grub. I want to come back to that. Uh, Jamie, you're up next. So like, what's your favorite bait? And then tube. Are you are you team tube or team Ned rig? So I'm team tube. Um, and I'll give a two-part answer, one for spinning gear and one for fly gear, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, so for spinning gear, I've really fallen in love with the Zip Ziggy, which is a topwater walk-the-dog bait. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure they really make them anymore, but some sort of topwater uh, walk-the-dog bait and then um, a suspending jerk bait, like an X-Rat. Um, really love that. I caught a lot of fish and some big fish last year on that. For the fly rod, um, I love what's called Stealth Bomber. And if any of you guys are um, fly fishermen, you can look those up online. They're really easy to tie, really good top water bait. Um, and then my go-to, I do a lot of streamer fishing on the fly rod. And so it's a Murdich Minnow. And you can go with a standard sort of grand white. Um, I have one I like to use I call a Golden Minnow that I've done well with. Um, and a couple other colors. But that, that Murdich Minnow is dynamite. Wow. Yeah, we need to do a small, I need to do a small mouth fly fishing show at some point. There's so many more people that fly fish for smallies around here that I, that I realized since I started doing this show. Um, that's really cool. That's really cool. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, you're up boss. What is it? Tube, Ned rig, and what's your favorite bait? So it's interesting. I used to, I used to lean into the tube a lot. Um, I've moved to now to where I probably am throwing the Ned rig more, even though uh, at the last fishing, uh, at, the, at the last uh, fishing show I had with, with a friend, and we were we we were saying we were going to recommit and go back to the tube, uh, you know, and kind of you know, it's sort of funny that we got away from that. Now that being said, if we're talking, you know, we're talking favorite baits, I'm the, talking Ned Rig or tube for, in a winter time. Uh, actually, in the winter, my favorite thing to throw is a is a two point eight Kai Tech paddle tail. Uh, I, oh, I like to course. slow drag that on the bottom. I like that more than a Ned Rig or a tube. Why? Uh, that, that, that's done very well for me. Um, if we're going to talk favorite baits, uh, it, it, I, I want everyone here to listen closely. If you're fishing for smallmouth and it's after March 15th and it's before November 1st and you're not saying some kind of top water, just log off now. We don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> come on. Look, we, a top water bite in, for smallmouth is absolutely fantastic. A, a big fish hit what you know a variety of different top water baits play with them it, it, you just have to you have to wait until it's just pre-spawn and then from pre-spawn through uh you know through late fall uh that that can be a very that's a great great producer for big fish and again the bite is just just absolutely phenomenal um you know anything anything from poppers to stick baits to to buzz baits uh all produce some really 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 wonderful bites John, I'm gonna have to have you back on in top water season then too, and we can go through a big old I, I, 101 show there. I'd love that. Um, that, that that's so. It, it, I just think it's interesting ever since I started this show that there are people that are just so passionate about either one the Ned Rig or, or one the tube. Um, and, and you know, kind of gets into a couple of the questions that we have in the backlog. And don't worry, guys, we're gonna get to all the questions, so, but before not too long. So I'm gonna shout out real quick. Uh, we we we've got a we've got a club member by the name of Terry Cooney, and uh, and and Terry. 
Terry is, is we, we, those of us in the club who know Terry, we actually call it a Terry rig instead of a Ned rig. <laughs> Terry, uh, Terry is the guy when we used to, when, when I, and back in, back in 2000, all the guys were fishing the big uh, five and six inch Cinco's. That was the, that was all the rage. When the Cinco's would tear up and throw them in your box, Terry would ask for those and then Terry would cut them down to two or three inches long and fish them on it and, and basically fish them on a ball head jig. Hmm. So he's been doing Ned Rig before, before Ned Rig was discovered. And, uh, you know, great angler caught, caught a lot of fish. Uh, but he's, he's, he's our sort of a denotation of the river Ned Rig guy or Terry, Terry Rig guy. And with that said, uh, we have a really good question here. Uh, we got JP. Uh, JP has, and again, JP, you won a crankbait last week. I didn't forget. No, I forgot. I forgot to mail <laughs> it out. That's my bad. It'll be mailed out tomorrow. I'm sorry. Last week was insane. Uh, what is the Ned Rig slash rod, reel, and lineup setup you all like? Um, we can go clockwise. I, I, I know trying to, you don't even fish one. If it's not 20 pound test, you're probably not going to do it, right? <laughs> I know. I have, a, I have a Ned Rig rod. I have a nice. <laughs> Uh, medium action, uh, probably eight pound fluorocarbon. Uh, it's a nice reel. It's, it's a Shimano. Uh, yeah. So I would say se at least seven foot so you can cast it. Seven eight foot? Pound, eight pound fluorocarbon. Hmm. Okay. All right. Next up, Steve. Same thing. I, I personally throw a six, three medium, heavy spin cast. Um, I fish, um, a braided line exclusively uh with a with a fluoro leader on it that's for, for that bait that's what i'm going to throw mm, jamie that is very poetic but your He's mic never is sounded muted. better <laughs> sorry sorry guys um the uh so a seven foot medium action spinning rod i like braided line for that because of the sensitivity of it yeah. um, with a floral leader on it. Hmm. John. Yeah, for uh, it, it depends a little bit on season, but I uh, like right now I'll be fishing about a 6.6, a six, six, but I'll go uh, a 6.6 uh, a six, six medium light. I almost always go medium light with my, my Ned Rigger bottom presentations now. I use a 2,500 reel. I'm either using 10 pound test press, yeah, 10 pound test braid with a fluoro or mono leader. I actually will switch to a mono leader come like mid-May. I just like it because it's a, uh, you know, a eight pound test mono in a, you know, in a, in a green color. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Penrod speaks how highly of how well it blends in with the water. And that's just what I've done. And I'm, I'm comfortable doing that. And that's, so that's what I'll fish then. Right now I will fish about a eight to 12 pound test fluoro leader, uh, you know, on, on that rig. Interesting. And then Jacob, I just saw your question. That's really, uh, there. And so Jacob Bell just asked what floor, what pound fluoro do you run for that leader in general, just to make sure we say that again. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm typically between eight to 12. 8 to 12. And, and then my two setups, as, as you all know, because I've beaten you over the head with this, my my winter setup is a BFS rig. It's a bait caster. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a medium light, extra fast tip and a medium, extra fast tip. And I'll go with 12 pound fluorocarbon. Uh, that way, if I feel a leaf, I can just whack the damn thing. And if I hit a stick or whatever, it's fine. You know, when I sure. used to fish in the wintertime with braid to either an eight pound to six pound test leader, you just get snagged a lot. Sometimes you just don't get it back, especially if you're in a kayak. And so when I you, you use a BFS setup with that, with a jig head, basically a, a finesse jig head and a Ned rig, yeah, I'd miss some bites, but every time you swing, your percent chance of actually hit sticking one goes up. And then of course, you know, your classic setup, which is, you know, seven foot rod. And I'll go with 12 pound fire line, uh, fire line, huh, 12 pound sunline to a fluorocarbon leader. And it just depends. And we could go down that rabbit hole, whether you use six to eight, honestly, it's just, I think what you feel confident with, I, there's this guy I had on, I think it, uh, Jeff, Jeff, what are, I don't I forget what your last name is. I apologize, but Jeff came on the show uh, during the December episode, and he goes with four for his Ned Rig, which is insane. I could never fish four pound test on a Ned Rig, but he's had ton Jeff Miller, um, and he has tons of success with four pound test. But I'm like, dude, there's no way in hell I'm going to cast out there on the ground and, and be throwing a Ned Rig like that. But he does it really well. Let's see, and we got JP here, Jeff Rallo. Interesting to see how everyone is a little different. I've tried multiple setups. I like straight six to eight pound floral personally. 
I like that on a BFS setup now. I just had a problem with spinning rods and just going straight fluorocarbon. It's so much nicer to go braid to leader just for the handling purposes, in my opinion. Let's see, we've got so many other questions I, here. I agree with you there. I'm on spinning gear and I typically like a braid with a four, four o leader. I do not like straight four o on a spinning rod. And back in the day, I used to do it until I was intelligent and I tried to figure out how to tie either a NFG knot or, or a polymer or something. Um, the FG is a pain in the butt, but I still like it. I know you guys out there in chat are going to kill me for this because it's so freaking hard, but I just like how thin it is to do. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me get back up there to the question so we can actually get through all these today. Uh, ooh, this is going by Travis. Travis, why does nobody talk about the hair jig anymore? <laughs> I think that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't get, they, they don't work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, did they work? They work. Um, <laughs> I think like Rogers jigs, they make a really good hair jig. I think that's the point though, is like, yeah, it, it's almost like uh, the Whopper Plopper. There was like a year and a half before the Whopper Plopper got blown up that people were fishing at the highest levels. No one was talking about it because it was working so good. And then it got blown up. And I think the hair jig's the same way. I think what'll happen, this is house money here. When a big kayak Ooh. tournament is one fishing a hair jig for smallmouth, it'll blow it up into the market. But there's just no tournaments really for it to advertise its success, in my opinion. They're way too cost effective, you know. But they, they, we, we, us fishermen, we need to buy a lot more expensive baits than a, than, than a hair jig. We mm -hmm. don't. We don't want something that catches fish. We want something to catch the fishermen. <laughs> oh my goodness, we got so many guys. You guys are just awesome tonight with so many. Oh my goodness, we got Otis. Uh, Otis, so many smallmouth in Susquehanna. It seems like flatheads aren't having the impact that people have been talking about. They have been having the. They haven't been eating them, but they have moved them. Um, I have talked to some biologists. We're going to get them on the show as well, talking about how deep wintering holes don't have the same smallmouth in them because the flathead will take that over. Do I think that they're eating all of them? I don't know. That's all anecdotal evidence, but I do think that they're changing their behavior a little bit. That, I think, can't be argued with. Um, let's see. We've got another one from Bucktail Fishing. The grass is definitely back now. We had, uh, yep, we just we went through that one. Absolutely, boss. I 100% agree with you. Um, let's see how long a leader. Oh, this is a good one here. Travis, again, it seems that everyone has different preferences, but how long will your leaders be more specifically in the winter time? And I'll add to your question, Travis, would there be a difference in your leader size depending on the season? So okay, I I'll know take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> uh, I, I, actually, in the winter time, uh, de depending upon the water clarity, sometimes uh, sometimes I'll actually tie straight to braid, um, and meaning I won't even bother with a leader. Um, really? But once the if it's winter time and the water's clear, I will go with a leader. Um, I I you know I might tie a I, I might tie like a four foot leader on there, but I'll I'll fish it down to where it's uh, eighteen inches before I before I retie. I mean uh, you know if it's winter time. In the summertime, I'm typically fishing a four to six foot leader. I've heard other what? people. I've heard other people that go, you know, that, that go really nutty with their leader lengths. Yeah, I think during this time of the year, the water is really stained. So I agree with yeah. John. I, I'll yeah. I'll go out and fish straight braid as well, and not worry about the leader. Um, it's you know it's that greenish you know that brownish greenish stain in the water, um, and the fish aren't going to see it. That's interesting because I feel like. We've been conditioned. Maybe it's marketing uh, that's gotten us where it's like, well, if you don't fish a fluorocarbon leader, you're stupid and you'll never catch anything. And it's like, yeah, I mean, back in the day, I used to also throw, you know, straight mono with with the spinnerbait. And guess what? Even though I had to like do like a crow hop to set the hook, it still worked. So I, I do think it's weird how they hit, they've conditioned us that you have to throw leader. Uh, uh, and there's certain times in the summer that I will go straight mono, especially as water clears up. We got Otis again here, boss. I'm going to bang this out here too for you. Seven medium light with 15 pa power pro and eight pound is, is your go-to. Yeah, dude, that's a really strong one. Beaver Hall, Beaver Hall. That was a really cool during the Augusta County fishing show. You, you sent me that, that photo, that state record, uh, state record uh, rainbow. That was impressive. Uh, being an avid angler who gets lucky and wins a few tournaments each year, you might think I'm lying, but I've never caught a bass on a Ned rig. You're lying. Uh, two inch teaser <laughs> tube, knocking them out or my own hair jig. So that's why that's my earlier season go-to bait. I'm listening 
but for tips. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just joking, boss. No, the hair jig, once you said hair jig, I was like, yeah, that's probably right. That's probably why you're winning all your money. You, you see, dude, that answer your other question. Like, people are fishing it. They're just not going to tell you they're fishing it. Yeah. Um, those hair jigs are just so freaking deadly. Um, and then we got we got Craig Anthony again. Uh, they say moving rocks. Uh, they said they said moving rocks around the river and creeks are messing things up. I I don't think moving rocks around and stuff like that with the habitat. I don't think that's the habitat destruction that's affecting the river. Honestly, I think it's the water quality issue that's still happening with the whole mercury dump, and it's just the complete blowout of the water. William Barnes. Flathead is apex is an apex predator that eventually will impact the population of all the other fish species in the given body of water. Yeah, I don't want to think about that right now. That's very depressing to me. Um, bucktail fishing, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Um, I usually tie on two arms with a bit long, but leaves plenty of room to tie on new stuff a few times before tying on a new leader. My rule of thumb personally is you want to get the leader into your rod guide or in, into the reel. That way, if you break off, you will still have some leader. If you usually have that leader not outside your guides when you get snagged, high percent chance that you're going to have to retie the whole thing. So enough to where you can get that sucker back into the spool and you should have a chance of it breaking near the eye guide. But that's just my personal thoughts. Um, let me see. Let's get through here. Let's get, ah, I'm almost caught up. That's amazing. You need to work on your leader knot. <laughs> well, what's your favorite? Uh, I I use the FG now. I'm sorry, I I, I don't want to, you know. But that's I'm I'm comfortable. I, I I'm kind of a believer that if you tie something, uh, you know, a couple dozen times, you'll 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 want to do it. And William Barnes, you just won a uh, you just want a Tiger crankbait from Tiger Crankbaits. Uh, so if you could just message me all of your information, and I will send you a gift card to Tiger Crankbaits as well. They can also custom paint you anything that you would like. And then that's actually a good question because it just popped into my mind. Crankbait fishing, do any of you guys do that? And if so, what kind of color patterns do you think work the best for smallmouth? So in the spring, I like to use a lipless crankbait now. And really? I, I, yeah, and I, I like either a perch or bluegill pattern, and uh, I've I've had some pretty good pre-spawn success with those. I've got a buddy that I fish with that loves uh, loves a square bill that swims at about three to five feet and bounces it off the bottom, and he does he does fantastic with it. I'll tie the same bait on, and I'll catch half as many fish as he does. It's, it, it's it's like any other bait. It's a confidence bait, but I think it also has a little bit to do with his retrieve over mine. Do you ever just do like chartreuse and black or any hot colors in general? Or like, because you said bluegill and perch color, which is very interesting because I wouldn't have thought that. Uh, uh, silver black, you know, is the traditional color I will use. Interesting. Interesting. That's so interesting to me because I've never caught one on silver and black, but I've caught them on crayfish color and hot chartreuse. <laughs> so yep. I don't know. There you go. I've never, I've, I've never gotten one on hot chartreuse. It, we mentioned, I have Helgramite popped up a couple of times in the comment section, and I know there's a bunch of people that have caught, they always say back in the olden days when everything was black and white, Andy Griffith was on, I used to catch them on Helgramites. I, do you guys, have, have you guys ever used a Helgramite bait and caught one? Because I don't think I have ever. No, Hel Helgramite will, um, you know, but I, I, I personally would rather just throw a Ned Rig. I mean, that, that to me is definitely where it's at. I mean, I guess there might be a sometime where it actually will work, but I've I've never had, I've never had a. Yeah, no, it's never worked for me. Uh, we got Joseph in the chat. Uh, what is the ideal future if the smallmouth? What is the ideal future of the smallmouth fishing club? It seems like it came a long way. That is a great little segue there. So, who would like to tackle that bad boy? All right, uh, Mr. President. So, what we're trying to achieve is kind of get back to where we were. And where we were pre-COVID, we would meet at the Vienna Firehouse. <clears throat> we would have somebody come in and speak, and that may be a guide. It may be somebody from DNR. It may be uh, a biologist. But we would, every month, with, like I said, with the exception of December, um, have the meeting, have somebody speak, and we might have as few as, you know, 30 people there and in our heyday, we were a club that had in excess of 100 members. Um, we are unfortunately aging. I think he said you were born in 88. That is, again, as we discussed, was the year that kind of the club started. Um, 
we have people in positions. I am president. I believe I was supposed to serve a, a two-year term, and I think I'm now at double digits. John's a past president. Jamie's our current treasurer. Again, John served the president, and he did a double stack. Jamie's been the treasurer as long as I've been president. So we all have kind of been in our positions uh, longer than we probably should have been. Um, we are hoping that we can continue to meet uh, at the, you know, Vienna Inn, talk fishing. You know, the perfect, perfect blend for us would be to have these young people that are out kayak fishing want to join the club and get us back to where we were. Um, we some just kind of a few things. We, I know we talked about the fishing side, also the conservation side. So our club piggybacks with another club called New Bass Horizons. Two times a year, we basically have a kids fishing derby, and that happens in Reston at um, Fairfax Lake. Is that correct? Lake Fairfax. Lake, Lake, Lake Fairfax. Lake, New Lake Horizon. Fairfax. Yes. So. Um, so that's kind of another that's kind of another thing that the club does is a give back. Uh, the kids come out. There's kind of age brackets, and I'm just going to say there's an under 10 age bracket and a 10 to the 15 age bracket. The top 10 kids, and when they bring a fish, and it's predominantly sunfish, but every once in a while you get a, a little guy that brings in a bass. Um, they walk away with fishing tackle uh, rods, tackle boxes. And, and all, everybody that comes that day gets fed, you know, it's been hot dogs in the past. So it's, it's kind of a great way to give back and get the, you know, the really, really younger kids out fishing and get them interested. In. And then guys, as always, link in the episode description, and everything that we talked about today. Uh, and then of course, it'll be re-uploaded to YouTube, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio. You all know where that you can find this and we can, get, we can really hope keep this club alive and we can get the age level down below 50. So we'll definitely yes. get that banged out as well. <laughs> Um, you guys, wow, while we're talking, you guys are so freaking generous online right now. Let's insane with the questions. Uh, I've never, uh, we got Victor Albert, one of our OG Patreon members, by the way. Huge shout out to you, Victor. Uh, I've never had luck with anything you saw truce. And I've, this is to me where it's, it talks about the whole color thing just for a minute. I, I have interviewed way too many people and everyone has their own secret color. And it's like, but, and then they'll say, like, but that color won't work over there. And then you interview, they're like, oh, that's the only color I throw. So, are the colors just for us personally? Do they actually, the fish actually care? Or is it just a rare circumstance? And then Sean's like, nope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm one of the persons that believe that color doesn't matter. I don't, I, what, for all the years I've fished in the, in the Potomac, what I find is that there's always like a bite window. Like there's a window where no matter what you throw, the bass are just, they're all eating. And then all of a sudden it shuts off. Um, so, you know, when, when I saw that, that, that question, you know, that he doesn't have any luck with chartreuse, that's my favorite color. Uh, I always have a, a chartreuse and white swim jig. And I would say 80% of my fish are caught on that color. And that looks nothing like anything in, in nature. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering why, you know, do the bass see it better? I don't know. But um, that is my favorite color. And that's what I have tied on. But that looks nothing like anything that they eat. Um, you know, I see tons of crayfish and, you know, the, the green pumpkin is, is the color that matches it the most, the closest. Um, and you think that would be a natural bait color to use, but, um, I, I truly believe that if the bait companies didn't have a hundred colors, they wouldn't just make as much, as much money. So, um, they want you to think that color matters and, and some people are going to argue that it does, but, um, I, you know, I, you can, when, when the fish are biting, they'll hit anything. I think when the fish are biting, they'll hit anything. I, I would love to know, and maybe there's a biologist out there, because I, I, you know, sheepishly, I've never asked the question if the fish are colorblind or not, and if it's just different shades that they're actually seeing. Uh, let's see. We there's got actually studies out there that do talk about fish see different, see colors differently than we do. So, for example, they talk about, you know, it, it is counterintuitive for us to go out at nighttime and throw a black lure. But that's what you were, you, if you read about what to throw at night, they say throw black. And then according to another, uh, other things like red translates to black for a fish underwater or so, so I'm told, but hmm. uh, um, uh, I think, I think there is, a, you know, I'm, I'm contradicting myself. I, I do think that there is a, uh, you know, within the range of color, uh, th th there's an excess and of, of what, you know, of what we need 
But um, that being said, my 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 demographic, and I, I that's a whole different thing. It's just my personal study. I will have you know 10, 10 kids throwing the exact same bait, and there's always one that just outfishes everyone, and that's just basically their you know that the, there's people that are that are going to be anglers and they're mm. on this call. There's other kids that are just there to, just to learn. But I, I find it interesting that if you throw a, uh, you know, a three inch worm on a, you know, on a circle hook and, and four of them are white, four of them are green pumpkin and uh, four of them are, are pink. And the, the four kids throwing pink uh, are at three to one versus the other two guys. Well, it's a pink day. It might not, you know, it, it just seems to be, it might, it, it, so, so I think, it, you know, I think playing with color a little bit isn't, isn't such a bad, uh, isn't such a bad idea for your, for your strategy. Great answer. Right on, right on. We got Curtis Cole, Kurt, Kurt Cole. Uh, they were chewing on the ghost shad jerk bait Saturday, 43.5 degree uh, water. That's up near my area. Probably the big slack four lock area, dude. Yeah, no, you absolutely killed it up there. And I can't wait for our fishing tournament in a couple of weeks. Right. I can actually fish again. Uh, and then we got bucktail fishing again, a square bow bite. Yep, absolutely. And then we got Greg. Here's a good question. Uh, Greg, with is there a magic water temperature that turns on the smallmouth bite? What is everyone's thoughts on that? I don't know that there's a magic temperature, but when that water is really, really cold, and let's say sub 40 degrees, you know, you're told that you've got to fish slow. You've got to fish the bottom somewhere between 40 and 50. That uh, jerk bait bite is probably going to be on fire, depending on where you're fishing. Um, so I, I don't know that there's, a, 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 you know, a, a hard fast rule as far as what, what temperature it's going to turn on or turn off. I think tinfoil hat here, and this is what I've always thought: it's daylight. I think it really comes down to there's some. There's some point in time when there's like so many more minutes added to the clock that they know spring is here. And on the flip side, when they're when you're taking away time in the fall and the grass starts dying, that is the cue when the September and the fall transition happens. I I feel like if you could figure out how many minutes that has to be on the clock, you'd be making a million dollars because you would know the transition period. But I really feel like it's something to do with daylight. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I I think I think there's some water temperature things that are relevant, like you know, depending upon what you're fishing too. Um, true. You know, jerk bait. It, you know, jerk bait is a uh, you know, it, it's another great winter bait. You know, you you get it to depth, you let it just you, you let it let it stand there. Uh, you know, kudos to the uh, to to the guy who's just uh, crushing them. You know, in 43 degree water, that's that's beautiful. But uh, I think you know, if, if when you, before you start getting into numbers of smallmouth, I, I, I'm usually starting to see those somewhere in a 52 to 53 degree plus range. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I'm talking, I'm talking, you know, more numbers, not necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean larger fish, but in the spring, you know, we tend to get larger fish in the spring anyway, you know, pre-spawn, I, or at least I do. And I, and, but I find that, uh, Certain baits start that you know, I I, I widen my my uh, my offering. Uh, you know, once the temperature gets up, to, it gets up above you know above uh, fifty two or fifty three. Yeah, know, I'll, I'll throw a top water at that point. I. <laughs> so is spring for you? It's like pre top water and then post top water. Is that is that how spring no, is no, like? It, I, 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 I shouldn't say that. I am. <laughs> I am. I, you know, I, I am a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit of. You know, I, I do. I do enjoy that, but you know. Uh, like Steve, if I'm out, I've always have a, you know, I always have a few rods that are rigged with different things and you want to cover all water columns uh, until the water gets to be about uh, 52 or 53. I typically don't have a top water tied on how, how that, that's more of a, that's more accurate of a description of how I'm fishing. That makes sense. Right on. Let's see. I got Justin Marsh, Mad Toms, and then we got to lose my place here, guys, because you guys are not like quitting. Uh, Justin Marsh, uh, I used to catch them and Mad Toms in in a sane. Uh, the smallmouth love them. Yeah, Mad Toms are a really cool bait that no one talks about. Jason T, you just want to crankbait to uh, tiger crankbaits, please message me Instagram, Facebook, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com to recoup your prize. Helgramite soft plastics are fire on the Shenandoah. They they work best with one-eighth ounce jig heads at the end of set of wraps. Interesting. I never thought about that. 
Uh, let's get, scroll down here. My God, the questions are coming in hard and fast now. Bucktail fishing, given your comments on where you work and cleaning intakes, know exactly where you work. Live in <laughs> Mercersburg and Williamsport often. Interesting. Because that goes down to bucktail fishing, which what he said was one was a synthetic latex and the other they called dark uh, liquor or something like that. We had to adjust our water treatment because of it. And they are talking about a the mercury and water issue spill. And, and that, that stuff, that litigation is still going on in parts of the river. I'm just lucky that the Potomac River never got hit with that kind of stuff. Um, like the Shenandoah, which just got absolutely devastated. Tanner Norris, here you go. You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Again, message me on Instagram, Facebook, or, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Uh, I catch a lot of smallmouth on the Mega Bass Spark Shad in lime green color. Interesting. My go-to spinnerbait is also white and chartreuse. I, I think uh, who mentioned? I think John, you mentioned you you pull a swim bait on the bottom in the winter. Why do you do that? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I. So, so listen. This goes back to pitching the club. There's an older club member that kind of got me got me into doing that. Uh, all, all you tournament fishermen, you know, come come be a part of the smallmouth club. We'll share information with you guys. You, you can be tight-lipped as you want to, but it gives you a group of, of like-minded people that you can brag to about your catches, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> now, that being said, I, I, use, a, I use an eighth ounce. I, I, I use an eighth ounce belly weight on a, on a uh, you know, 2.8 Kitech paddle tail. That's what I like. Uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get into colors and technique at some other point. But uh, I, anybody that's catching them on uh, Helgramites Below Riffles, Anybody that's catching them on, uh, you know, on a Ned rig, it, it, you want to play around with the same bait, fish it the same way, fish at the deep pools, fish at the back eddies. You'll be happy. You'll, you'll be happy you did. And, and fish the colors that you're confident fishing, not not the ones that I would suggest. I agree with that. Fish what you're comfortable with. That's really important. Uh, we've got JP. Uh, I agree with Thomas. I think daylight is definitely a big factor. I do think, I, I'm not saying 100% like, Temperature doesn't have anything to do with it. 100%, I believe it does. But I think we always, the literature always says the temperature and then never talks about the daylight factor either. And now, now I will say this, to really get granular with my, my thought process, I think daylight plays an even more of a factor in the fall because the temperatures a lot of times kind of feel the same in the fall because you get an Indian summer, but the fish kind of get weird. I think that's because the, day, the days just get so much shorter, and that's the first thing that'll trigger them, generally speaking. Again, that's my personal opinion there. Uh, we got Tanner again. Uh, Helgramite soft plastic baits are fire. I, I love how everyone in the comment section is like, they throw a Helgramite bait, and I haven't caught a damn thing on a Helgramite bait <laughs> because of probably I'm missing out. Uh, nobody, okay, Jason T, again, nobody is talking about the double cicada hatch this year. Is that this year? I don't know if that's here, though. Please look at where that's happening. I don't know if that's happening in our area. Hmm. Was it 17 years ago? When was the, the big the 17 brood year hatch was like three years ago. The but three there's, years, oh. there, there is a big there is a big double brood happening that they've they've been writing about online, but I don't think it's our area. Hmm. All right, that's good to know. And we got uh yep, yeah, I got that question there. We got a couple more guys, and then we're gonna we're gonna get to our closing thoughts here. Nobody is talking about the uh, yep, that that's the wrong one because I am absolutely clicking the wrong buttons here apologies Double hold on right here. Double, oh here we go by justin marshall justin marshall uh, i am staying near dublin and want to do a little kayaking where would you go clear lake or new river and where near me on the new thanks justin uh yeah thank that's a good question for me to have i would say if you're trying to just do smallmouth fishing i would say go straight to the new river not clear lake clear lake absolutely sucks unless you have forward facing sonar if you just want to paddle around and have a great time, go to Clear Lake. Otherwise, the New River is fantastic. What I would suggest you do is go call one of the guides down there. Uh, Ethan Stone, I can give you his number if you want me to message me. What's nice about those guides down there is they will tell you where to go so you don't like die because that river there has class rapids that is very gnarly down there. And that's the one thing that the pros, the, the when the Hobie series went down there, it's different than like the Upper Potomac, which in general, besides like, well, the Great Falls, it's safe-ish there you do have some rapids you'll go down so please message me and i'll get you in contact with one of the guys down there to make sure that you uh you stay safe yeah um, also also look up brit stoudemeyer of uh of new river new river canoe or no um new river outdoors. What? what it used to be canoe the new maybe it's something different yeah, but Britt Stoudemire, I fished with him several times. He is completely dialed in on that river. He's absolutely terrific. So Britt's great. 
reach out to him. What he said, <laughs> reach out to him. And then if I'll try to get his uh, contact information as well, and I can send that to you. Uh, we got, oh, here we go. Rob's Woods and Custom Sawmilling. Uh, get the Nico Helgramite. My God. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to have to buy this and try this out at this point. This is kind of making me feel a little bit weird. The, the super durable and they work. Is this, is it, are you guys doing this because of all the YouTubers that fish this thing? Because uh, I know Creek Fishing Adventures really likes this stuff and so does Fishhawk. But yeah, I got to start trying this thing out because uh, everyone keeps promoting this or they're all on the payroll of Nico. So it's one of the two. <laughs> um, second, and then oh. Bucktail Fishing, second, like second vote for Nico Bates. I have no, yeah. What is everybody's favorite Nen Rig bait, by the way? Is it, is it just boring old Z Man or do you guys have some kind of dark horse company? Z All Z-Man? Z-Man? Z-Man. Z-Man, Roboworm, a couple others. Ooh, Roboworm. Okay, there's a there's a good one. Yeah. Those All the, right. You know. And then we got um, Lamp37 on Instagram. That is a... That's that's a choice for a name. I'll say that. That's a choice. Uh, their <laughs> question right here is, what is anyone's goals this year when it comes to fishing? Do you want to go somewhere else besides the Ever-Potomac River? So that's, let's just do goals. Like, does anyone have any fishing goals? Uh, Chun, are you going to try to win AOI this year? Uh, every year, that's my goal. <laughs> that's my goal AOI, and I, I'd like to place it. I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fish the, uh, the BASS and the Susquehanna this summer again. And, uh, hopefully I'll pick a spot that will give me two days of good fish. So will the swim jig play? At least top 10, huh? Will the swim jig play? Oh, that's guaranteed. <laughs> That and a jackhammer. <laughs> that and a jackhammer. <laughs> if I had, it, had it only two rods, it would be that. It would be a swim jig and a jackhammer. I take roughly six rods with me when I fish in my kayak in Upper Potomac. But if I was just told to take two, it would be a jackhammer and a swim jig. And I think it would be a tough, t- like like Steve was saying, uh, a uh, what do you call it, a buzz bait. Uh, don't be afraid to throw a big buzz bait on the Potomac. Uh, hmm. you'll catch all kinds of fish, but the, but the big smallmouth will absolutely destroy that bait. Uh, Chun, when you're throwing your buzz bait, do you, do you throw a trailer on it? Uh, no. Really? Yeah. I don't throw a trail on it. Why? It's got a, you know, it has the big, you know, skirt on it already. So I don't, if I do it, it'll be like a small grub just to put some weight on it. Yeah. So and cast it. So uh, you- but not, not a big one. So you do do a skirt versus like, I think the hot thing now is like a swim bait or some kind of soft plastic versus. Yeah. A I mean, I, if I throw, if I throw anything on, it's like a double tailed grub, like some, but nothing too big. Um, but yeah, the, the buzz baits are fun to fish in the summertime. Silver or copper gold blades on, on the buzz bait. They're, they're, they're coming for the noise. It doesn't matter the color. I don't think hmm. it's short. I mean, if, if I had anything, it'd be a chartreuse probably or white. Um, but uh, I, you know, I use those old lunker, the lunker lures, the buzz bait with a three plop, you know, three prop blade. And I, it's just, it's just the more, the more commotion, the better. That's interesting. I never would have thought about that actually. So I, everyone just throws a single. I don't think any, I don't think about the f- and chat. Maybe you can help me out. What was the last professional angler to throw a double? Cause I feel like everybody just throws a single blade. And I think yeah. it's because everyone skips docks. Oh, go, John. I said Steve Kim. There you go. <laughs> Steve. The, the, the one thing that, I, again, nobody really talks about, and this is complete minutia when it comes to buzz bait. When I'm throwing that double and I throw it out, I know it's going to come straight back to me. When you're throwing a single, inevitably it's going to want to walk to the left or the right, depending on which way that blade's set up. And that's not a bad thing. Like I said, the, to me, it's just a lot of profile in a small, compact bait. And hopefully, again, that's attracting bigger fish. I gotta start trying that again. I, I think it's weird. It's like once the Whopper Plopper came in, I feel like a lot of people was like, well, I'm not gonna throw the buzz bait anymore when the Whopper. And, and I think it had success, but now I think everybody and their brother throws it and those fish kind of get used to that noise and that profile. I mean, I do think they're that intelligent that they do get wary of certain baits. Um, Absolutely. John and I fish together often as do Jamie and I. And because, you know, we're on the same boat, we're talking. It, there's days when that, and, and Jamie the same way, there's days when kind of that zip ziggy walking the dog pattern crushes the buzz bait. And then there's other days when for some reason that didn't work, but the buzz bait outperformed it. 
Mm-hmm. With that said, with the bait, I mean, the one question I want to ask you, John, is like, what are some goals you have this year? Is it uh, a smallmouth PR? Is it going somewhere interesting to fish? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, uh, so locally, I, I guess I'll stay locally, you know, locally, I, I, my, my goal this year, uh, would, it'd be nice to get, uh, you know, get double digit people into citation fish. So, you know, I, uh, last year, last year I had, uh, you know, in, in May, 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 early June is the only time that, uh, and then, and then the fall are the only times I get to guide because the rest of the time I'm, I'm working with my youth programs. And uh, this this past uh, last spring, I had uh, I had eight trips where I was able to get people their you know their their PBs and uh, you know and uh, I had uh, you know seven of those eight got uh, you know got citation fish. So uh, I'd I'd love to get that to double digits. As far as me, I'm 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 kind of like Jamie now. I I, I I you know I'm old. I'm I'm old. I've got I, I have limited days of fishing in front of me. I want to go do salt water down. I want to run down to Florida and chase tarpon and snook. And uh, you know I'm pl- I'm playing with the trip to go to uh, to put together a group to go down to uh, chase uh, peacocks uh, in Belize. But that's I'm oh, sorry, Belize, Brazil. I was gonna say so. That's a that's a whole nother thing. That sounds insanely fun. And then you're a guide. I don't. I almost slipped my mind. I didn't know you were a guide. I, I don't guide a lot. Uh, my primary business is my is my youth programs. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about possibly doing a show about that at another time, because today I really wanted to focus on the smallmouth club. It means so much to me. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if you uh, want to plug but, it real quick, go for it. We got like six hours. So. Oh, well, no, I just, uh, you know, well, well, you know, Fish and Explore is my company. Uh, uh, basically, it it's just it, it was my way to move from just being a guide to actually having a sustainable business where we teach youth. We work with uh, youth ages seven to 16 and we immerse, we have week long immersive uh, fishing, kayaking and uh, nature hiking, exploring programs. And so our, so our programs, we do that all through the summer as kids are off during school. When we're not, when I'm not doing that, I'm either doing, uh, you know, doing fishing for smallmouth or I'm doing travel destination trips. Hmm. Dude, that's really freaking cool. Yeah, absolutely. We can we can uh, bring you on just to talk about that. But then as always, um, guys, I'll just link that in the episode description, you know, when this is re-uploaded. So you can scroll down there and then you can find that as well. Uh, what is your, uh, and, and, and um, sorry, we're going to, we're gonna, Steve, we're going to get to you in a minute. But first, John, what is your biggest smallmouth? You know, my biggest smallmouth is, not, I, I've got a, I got a 21 and a half. I, I really, uh, you know, I mean, it's nice, but I, I, 22 is the number I can't beat. And by the way, the, the 21 and a half that I caught didn't break five pounds. So I'm just like pulling my hair out from that, from that perspective. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you're just like you get this giant river fish, but I caught it. I caught it in June. It was post spawn and it was, it was long, but you know, the belly was no longer full. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Steve, uh, we're going to, we're going to hop to you now. Um, yeah. What are some fishing goals, dreams that you have uh, this year? And then we'll also ask you your biggest small mouth. I like other people. I love to venture out, but the truth is, I do most of my fishing either on the Potomac or the Shenandoah. Love to fish the Rappahannock. The problem I have with the Rappahannock is the water tends to fall out of it very quickly. And having a bigger boat, it's you know I need a certain amount of water to get through the, the areas that I like to fish. That's a that's a great thing I want to ask you about since you, yeah, I'm assuming you fish the Rappahannock a decent amount. I, not as much as I'd like to. And, and last year was kind of an odd year. It just, we didn't get a lot of rain in the springs. We didn't get a lot of rain through the, the summer. So there was just, you know, it was, it was, you know, me having a bigger boat, it was harder for me to, to pick and choose where I wanted to float. And, and the other thing, the Potomac, really that grass really picked up yeah. It really got kind of almost to a choking out stage in areas that normally it wouldn't. So again, every year is different. Um, but like I said, I, 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 like everybody else, I want to see a wet spring, but not a wet spring that, you know, blows out the fry and, you know, basically gives us another year of, you know, uh, of, you know, no fry. 100% agree with that. And what's your PR smallmouth? Uh, 21 on the new. New. I was waiting for the new to come up in this conversation. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense actually a lot. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, Jamie. 
Yeah, so personal best was actually a 22-inch smallmouth I caught back in the early 2000s on the uh, main stem Shenandoah River. Um, it right. came on a tube uh, below an exposed root ball on a sycamore tree. Um, but this was back before the fish kills on the Shenandoah, um, where to go out and have 100 fish day on the Shenandoah was not a big deal. So, um, But that was, you know, 20 years ago. So I'm <laughs> hoping to beat that at some point. Some um, days. A personal goal, I would really like to catch a 20-inch smallmouth on a fly rod this year. I did catch a 19 last year on a fly rod when I caught a couple of 20-inchers on spinning gear. But to get one a 20-inch on a fly rod would be a goal. And then along with John, some destination fishing. Um, I don't know if it'll happen this year, but um, one day I want to chase a 100-pound plus tarpon on a fly rod, maybe oh, down to Costa Rica. Dude. Uh, a half-caught tarpon on fly rod, um, and that'll change your life, but none uh, none that big. Um, and then also uh, really intrigued for some peacock bass. I caught some small ones in Florida a couple weekends ago and would love to chase some bigger ones maybe down in Brazil. Okay. What's the biggest thing you've caught on a fly rod, period, any, any type? Well, that depends. Was it intentional or unintentional? Um, <laughs> People if it don't was, count. There is fly fishing. It's always unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it was, I mean, unintentional, you know, you hook something down in Florida and then you have a big, like, you know, 200 pound shark or 300 pound Goliath grouper bite it. But that wasn't what I was trying to get. Um, the biggest. Oh, the biggest I would say on fly rod actually was just this past fall. I was fishing out of Summers Point, New Jersey, and hooked a uh, 40 inch plus striped bass, striper. Good God. Uh, on the fly rod, that was probably a good 35 or 40 pound striper. So, <sighs> so deliberately targeting it, that's probably the biggest I've caught on fly rod so far. That's got to be so much fun. That's got just, that's just so much more work than casting and, and winding <laughs> when you're having to strip like that. And I've seen some of those saltwater fly rods. It looks like a you'd put a flag at the end of it. They're so long. I mean, that's <laughs> got to be a workout for your shoulders. Yeah. Technology well, has come such a long way for us to go back to doing tenkura fishing. <laughs> it's painful and a piece of string. <laughs> yeah, let's just say it took me a long time to land that fish, but uh, <laughs> it was a fun fight. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, again, guys, I know the comment section is like hitting this one too. We will be doing a, more of a small mouth fly fishing thing here. Cause I know we have dead drift, which is like, I think the youngest, uh, I'm going to just say he's the youngest guy that's really well known as a fly tire. He's uh, under the age of 20 and he kicks out some great stuff. And looking at the stuff that he ties and the, the cult following there are for small mouth on the fly, we'll definitely make a show just separate about that. Cause I think it's very interesting with the fly people I've talked to. They're way more in tune to nature and looking at things than I think guys that just cast and wind just in general. Because if you have that trout background, you got to do that to match the hatch. So again, you know, just kind of my, my thoughts there with that. But you know, we're we're getting up to about an hour and twenty two here. Um, you know, we're not going to go for four hours tonight. Do we have any closing thoughts about just fishing in general and the club? Again, uh, just kind of putting the word out there to anybody that might be interested in joining us. Our website is prsc.org. We also have a footprint on Facebook, which is Potomac River Smallmouth Club. Uh, right now, the way we're set up is we are, are meeting the last Wednesday of every month at the Vienna Inn in Vienna. Uh, if you've never been there before, it's a very easily search. Uh, you can just search Google. It is literally right off of 123 in the heart of Vienna. Um, gentlemen, what else would you guys add? Really? Um, I guess my okay. thought would be not not to be too philosophical is, uh, you know, I've learned less in the last couple of years that life is short. And if you love to go fishing like we do, go fishing. If you have a day to go, go. Maybe it's not perfect conditions. Maybe the water stand. Maybe it's rainy. Maybe it's something else. Go fishing because we all have only a certain number of times we can go. So yep. take advantage of it. You heard it here, guys. Jamie told you, don't tell your wife. Just go buy a boat. Don't ask for permission. <laughs> life is short. I ask for forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> That's what I do all the time. Um, and then we'll, uh, we have one last, guys, this will be the last question that we're going to do here. Uh, last question will be right from here, which is again, bucktail fishing. Have any of you guys fished the Monocacy? I did real good around Frederick last year. And so, I've, I've fished the Monocacy. It's a, it, actually, it's a, it, it's a nice little river. 
uh, you know, it feeds right in, it feeds right into the Potomac and there's a, you know, there's some good little floats you can do on there. I've, I've had, I've had some decent outings there. I've never, uh, I've, I've never broken, um, I've, I've, I've broken 18 inches there, but I've never, never broken, uh, you know, I haven't broken 19. Uh, there, there's a couple of nice little floats and, uh, I, I, Monocacy is, uh, you know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful river. I've, I've enjoyed it, but I just, uh, I've got, I've done decent numbers. I've never done, uh, any really big fish there. Yeah. I have not had the, I haven't had the pleasure yet of actually fishing the Monocacy, but I've heard, I could be wrong here. It's a great wading place in the summertime too. Uh, that place, the Conica jig Creek. Oh, go for it. No, no I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's easy to wait. I suggest throwing a Helger mite. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> joking joking aside actually uh, a, a helgramite on a uh, on a trout magnet has done quite well in the monocacy hmm because yeah, i know there's I, I have a lot of kids in the spring to the summertime that want like on summer break they want a place they can go catch a fish and they always want to go ponds and stuff i think rivers creeks are by far those fish are way easier to catch and finding a place that they can just go and and have success it's hard and so i think the monocacy is, is one if you're 15 16 years old that's a great place you probably could go wade kind of could jig up where i am it's no deeper than like four or five feet it's deepest and you can wade the whole thing and you're not gonna catch anything big but yeah. you're gonna catch something in i don't know ashburn area there's not goose creek but that's gotten so developed since i was a kid like it's hard to find a place you can wade that place yeah I agree, but just uh, just remind remind anybody if they're going to go wade fishing, take a friend. If they don't take mm. a friend, wear a PDF. If you do take a friend, wear a PDF anyway. Uh, you know, even if it's only two or three feet, uh, you know, if, if if you go down and uh, you know bang a rock uh, the right slash wrong way, uh, you can't swim if you're uh, not conscious. So please, you know, you want to you want to be fishing when you're my age. So, fish amen. Smart. Amen. And then lastly, we got Captain Steve in the house. Great group of guys. Absolutely. And then David yeah. Smith, New Horizon. Uh, v Vienna Inn. I've heard it's a place to buy a keg of beer. I've, <laughs> I've heard that you can throw some shots back, Dave. The legends are true. Uh, well, we wouldn't know anything about that, of course. But <laughs> but, uh, but the uh, the chili cheese dogs are quite good. They're, they're, they're a classic standby. Oh my God, they're they're absolutely amazing. Uh, as always, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about, please go check them out. The Vienna Inn is, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, uh, the Firehouse Inn Vienna is where they meet uh, at the end of each and every month. Facebook and their website will be linked in the episode description. Please go support them and keep them alive. Please go check us out on Patreon. Our overall goal is when we hit 1,000 Patreon subscribers, we're going to have a nonprofit set up where we can start doing some supplemental stocking of our own to help out our local waterways. Go check us out. Like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. We might be talking afterwards, but this stream is over. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.